This will be the only time you see my face on this YouTube channel. M maybe, I don't know. Now you might be asking yourself, why? And the answer is actually pretty simple. I've been wanting to make four more casual-ish style videos for a while now, talking mostly about video games still, but also anything else that comes to mind, and on things that aren't necessarily fit for YouTube. In fact, I already made a video about the trope of hiding things behind waterfalls in video games, and it's just kind of sitting around. And so, I won't post them to YouTube. As of today, I am now a member of the streaming service Nebula. So for those who don't know, Nebula is a service composed of nearly 200 high quality creators where you not only get ad free stuff, but brand new content both early and exclusive to it, not just from me, but from everyone else on there. I was already a fan of Nebula, so when Jacob Geller introduced me, I was immediately down to join. Beyond Jacob and I though, you also get Game Maker's Toolkit, Resbutin, Tirzu, I don't know, is that gaming? Whatever, you get all of them and many more. The Waterfall video is already up on Nebula as of the release of this video, as well as every other one of my videos completely ad-free. I also uploaded my original non-fucked by copyright version of my Bo Burnham's Inside Analysis video, something that's been impossible to watch since it released. So if you enjoyed this video and this channel and want access to hundreds of other channels worth of extra content from creators I respect as well as my own stuff, use my link on screen or in the description to join. It's $2.50 a month for like 50 times the benefit. As I said, click, you know, anywhere and the link is probably there. Anyways, I hope to see you on Nebula and time for your regularly scheduled programming. Gaming, at first, was a deeply personal act. Unlike movies and television, which, from their inception, were designed to be viewed by many people and in groups, games were quite the opposite. Most allowed the inputs of exactly one person, and often capped at four. They would need to be entirely restructured and designed around every single new person allowed to play, and it's for the simple reason that games were actually meant to be interacted with. If we were to make a diagram of interactivity from person to media, movies and shows would be like this. The audience is cleanly separate from what is happening in the media. We are voyeurs into the world being painted for us. The diagram for video games, in contrast, is a complete circle. Not only does the player affect what happens in the media, a game would not function without the player's input. This is the diagram that the vast majority of games to this day work with, and rightfully so. It might involve other players, both in person and online, have the interaction come from the game itself or other people, and might even have very little player input, but it all still fits. However, like with many things, once YouTube came into the scene, the culture of the internet and gaming itself began to change. Let's Plays, with their sudden and rapid explosion, turned video games into a community media. The movie diagram now, instead of being an audience and the media completely separated, became the audience in one bubble and the player and video game in their own. And while that bubble looks more complex, it's hardly different than the first one. Hundreds of thousands of people would watch someone interact with a world we couldn't interact with ourselves. They'd take place in a story, be confronted with conflicts and decisions, and even potentially grow as the game series goes on. They get better at the game, come to understand the rules of this world, even maybe learn something along the way. And it's weird, like it's so weird. We don't talk about how strange the concept of Let's Plays are. Like there was a few times where I was watching Markiplier and one of my sisters came in the room was like, why do you watch people play games? And all the usual responses pop into my head. I can't afford the game, I don't feel like playing games right now, it's no different than sports, but, it, but it's all bullshit, right? I watch Let's Plays because I like watching other people play video games. There is no media like video games, no other thing where this specific set of circumstances really exists. We, the audience, are on the third layer of interactivity, watching a person from a distance interacting with a universe that they aren't native to. And the reason, to me, why Let's Plays are so enjoyable is simply because you get to see someone else experience something like that. Many times when I watch a new TV show and end up loving it, I try to re-watch it with a friend so I can see all of their reactions to the things I already know are coming up. It's the purest form of social bonding, coming to understand someone through a shared experience. And as it turns out, exploiting this sort of thing is super profitable. Not to say that Let's Players are looking to get rich or anything, especially early on, but for many people, Let's Plays became the primary way that they experience video games. Whether it was just someone to bond with, like Markiplier, someone with clever commentary like Northern Lion, or someone that could just do things in games you couldn't like Shroud, it was and still is everywhere. Not only was it more accessible and took less effort, but a lot of times they were just more fun. I've said this in a previous video, but horror games suck to experience, and intentionally so. Watching someone else suffer though? Pure entertainment. And that makes the specific genre of horror games, and especially indie horror games, the clearest example of YouTube, of the audience's existence, being largely responsible for the genre being popular. 
Indie horror is a big thing because you don't need to play it yourself. So, suddenly, the factors that could make a video game successful got a brand new one, how much of a spectacle it is for other people. At the same time, enjoyment was, in some contexts, de-emphasized. In comparison to the amount of people playing a game, the amount of people watching was much greater. And even further, indie horror was one of the largest genres on YouTube, to a large extent because these people were suffering. Games like Amnesia arguably made the careers of some of the largest Let's Players of the modern day. The appeal of watching a sweaty, borderline cartoon character fear for their life was far too magnetic to fail, apparently, and I'm happy about that. If it didn't happen, we wouldn't have Markiplier, Pokemon Smasher Pass, the modern day Citizen Kane. For the newly budding indie game industry, indie games are newer than you think they are, YouTube was not only a viral source of advertising, but a free one. You could have your games spread across the entire internet while spending absolutely zero for promotion. And so, the indie games that became viral were the ones that necessarily appealed to the audience more than the player. One of my favorite examples of this is Turbo Dismount. Now this isn't a long genre of games that continues to this day, of what is essentially destruction simulators. I personally used to play interactive buddy and computer class at the school I went to, a class I literally did not understand the purpose of. The only thing I remember them trying to teach us was how to type, but even then they utterly failed at that. I still type with basically just two fingers, but I did play a lot of interactive buddy. The only thing you did in the game was pick various tools and weapons and just beat the ever-loving shit out of this grey bobblehead guy. The modern day equivalent is the ever-violent people playground, the almost natural endpoint to the evolution of the genre. Turbo Dismount, in comparison, kind of fucking sucks. That might be controversial to say, you might be mad at me, but like, would you play Turbo Dismount alone? With Interactive Buddy, there was a money system that let you unlock more features. People Playground just had so much interaction that there's a sort of progression of just exploring through it all. Turbo Dismount, uh, doesn't. You don't like unlock levels or cars or anything, it is just a game with scenarios. While there are obstacles and cars and interactions to explore, it's not like the levels are radically different from one another, and importantly, the feedback is not very satisfying either. There is no person in the history of video games that has cared about their turbo dismount score, it just has not happened. At most, your little guy gets separated into pieces, but that is the peak of this game. It's the type of thing you have fun with for an hour or two and then close it forever. But, if you are, say, a gaming YouTuber, you can turn this empty vessel of a simulator into a real gaming experience. Not for you, of course, but for your fans. In place of the generic royalty-free game soundtrack, they can be not just the storyteller, but the laugh track and the comic relief. The cars are branded with their face and channel logos, a sign that this is their car and this is their let's play. It served as a means to create bits, to check out user-made maps, to engage with the community, and essentially craft your own version of this game with your own fanbase. The game allows its content to be filled by something other than itself, and in part due to that, it was a viral sensation where it really had no place to be. Also, I just find this funny, but Jacksepticeye's series on it has part 1 go through some of the normal levels, then the entire rest of the 34 part series is on user-made levels, just something I wanted to point out. Nowadays though, the sort of turn on the recording, speak into a microphone and upload format doesn't really exist anymore, not on YouTube at least. Let's Play channels that make it these days have sort of adopted the modern podcast format, often having a group of people talking with basic edits for specific bits or just to cut out overly long silence. Even the old guard has adapted to this, a phrase I only use because comparing Markiplier and Jacksepticeye to the Abyss Watchers is a funny visual to me. The original format of uncut gameplay has its own sort of modern update though, and that comes through its migration to the streaming website Twitch.tv. While the general Let's Play concept doesn't change, it being streamed live creates one very real difference. The interactivity now goes both ways. The player interacts with the game, and the audience interacts with the player. Now, live performances have existed for a length of time I am not qualified to specify, but their chart is closer to this. It is an audience occasionally interacting with the performance directly. Suggesting songs at a concert, magic shows, comedy shows, game shows, well okay. This diagram has actually kind of existed in game shows like the crowd vote and who wants to be a millionaire, but in live streams it is a constant state of being. Nobody throws $5 on the stage of Family Feud screaming Omega Lil Plus 2, probably, I don't know. One of the most direct ways that live streaming affects Let's Plays is futuristic real-time backseating. YouTube channels could, in fact, be backseated to an extent, but videos were often uploaded in parts for one play session and days after it was actually recorded. So while, like, Undertale fans had the power to bully people into completely replaying the game, most times there was an acceptance that you got what you got and that was it. With live streams, the player has access to what is essentially a lifetime encyclopedia, one that constantly shouts at you instead of you needing to look anything up. 
In general, there's been an understanding in modern gaming that people can and will look up secrets and how-tos for almost any issue. In the same way that The Simpsons was one of the first shows to use lightning-fast gags due to the new ability to pause and rewind your TV, games have been designed more often now with the concept that secret finding is a collective act instead of an individual one. Speaking of Undertale, the game was practically ripped to shreds the moment it was released, and then those shreds were ripped even further into smaller and smaller shreds that the entire game became just one large pile of secrets and information. The other game that I never shut up about, Five Nights at Freddy's, has a significant portion of its appeal solely through the fact that the lore is so convoluted and absurd that even the entire internet working together can't seem to figure out what the hell is happening in the series at this point. This sort of attitude of ripping games to shreds and exploring every little detail gets translated into a fanbase's relationship with live streamers. More and more as time goes on, people become fiercely dedicated to one or two of them that they're borderline addicted to watching. And so, when entering a game with a passionate fanbase mixed with the streamer's own, it leads to futuristic, real-time bullying. If a streamer played Dark Souls 3, chances are they would not use magic, because people other than themselves would find the gameplay boring. Even just playing or finishing a game in general when someone might not want to happens constantly, literally only playing a game for the sake of others watching it. Not only is it the case of profitability for the games themselves, but for these people, how much of a spectacle they are directly informs the money that goes into their bank account every month. Some streamers use this idea to their direct advantage. One of the best examples nowadays is Dug Dug, whose existence and stream concepts are almost always only possible due to the existence of lifetime interaction. His most popular videos and streams are the ones where a program listens to everything he says, and if he accidentally says any of the given words in a word bank, he gets punished somehow. However, the words he chooses aren't necessarily hard to avoid, which brings the thing that actually makes it interesting. He needs to read out every single donation message. Have you ever taken a cab before? I have not. I have. I have, in fact. But I prefer Uber. No I like fear. Frank. Spawning beers. No! What did I say? And even beyond the stream concepts, he allows his Twitch chat to bully him in general. They can use stream points to do things like forcibly play the entire Zorby's Billy Mays Absorbent Towel ad, something that's been done so many times that Doug can recite it perfectly from memory. The secrets in the X27 fiber technology, making Zorby's over 27 times more absorbent than cotton. Even more famous for this sort of derailment is Germa985, letting singular chat messages spawn potentially hours long bits, getting more and more convoluted until it hits some kind of endpoint. One of my favorites is the Groggy Gary bit, one where someone made a fucked up image of Germa smoking a cigarette, only for someone else to tell him to leave it up so the Twitch auto-generated thumbnail gets it. From here, he starts to screenshot the thumbnail and then screenshot the screenshot, recursively adding more and more bullshit to the screen until it's barely comprehensible. And, most importantly, you can see his viewer count only get higher during this entire bit, one that mostly consists of staring at still images for 5-10 to 10 minutes at a time. The allure of it, I think, is not just the absurdity, but the idea that the entire community is collaborating to make this bit happen, or to add to whatever situation Germa's currently immersed in. Sometimes he gets bullied into playing Among Us VR, other times he's bullied into describing a gay love fantasy of eating bugs with a handsome buff doctor. None of this would realistically happen without a live audience. However, what most people consider to be Germa's magnum opus is, in some aspects, the logical and artistic endpoint of the sort of influence that the chat has, the Germa dollhouse stream. This stream is a video game, in the very same way that Twitch plays Pokemon was. The chat, while not directly controlling Germa's movements, were able to vote on his actions collectively. There were also cutscenes, per se, moments where nobody had control, but for the most part, it was a three-day event and kind of brilliant art piece in the control a fanbase has over a streamer. There have also been real video games that function off the same principle, or at least have some sort of Twitch integration. Jackbox games are the first to come to mind. While there's normally a small cap to the amount of players in-game, every single Jackbox minigame has some sort of audience feature. Most times, the entire voting feature gets uprooted from the players in the game to being almost exclusively in the power of the chat and most of the time the only thing that actually makes these games interesting. Most Jackbox games suck in my opinion, Trivia Murder Party is the best one. Anytime I've played like Quiplash or Champed Up with Only Friends, it devolved into people trying to be Jay Schlatter 2018 Call Me Carson, but way, way less funny. At least Trivia Murder Party has like actual games, you know? I kill the math section on that one, it's the only real reason I like it. Some games rely entirely on Twitch integration as well. Choice Chamber hit the wave early in 2014, being a simple but fun game where the Twitch chat chooses every little aspect of what the streamer is able to use. It's almost funny how sort of authoritarian the game is about it too. 
While other Twitch stuff is sort of gated by needing to wait for votes, the first room of the game just locks the streamer inside of it to play with a ball until the grown-ups decide what weapon they'll be allowed to use. The game overall is pretty simple and short, it didn't have a very long lifespan, but it was a prototype for this sort of idea going forward. One of the most known examples is Marbles on Stream. This isn't the exact same thing, as you don't really have control over your specific ball or anything, but the audience still does affect the gameplay. Specifically, the amount of marbles present significantly changes the flow of the maps being played. Some streamers have hunted world records on the maps, and the way they do it is by maxing out the levels. Due to the levels not really being designed for the absolute ball limit, some bugs with collision or incredibly rare interactions with the level itself are far more likely to happen. Games like this and Kokoro are much more equivalent to like playing fetch with your audience. You just kind of throw the ball out there and give them something to do when you don't feel like entertaining them. And in that way, in these games, in Twitch Plays Pokemon, and in the Dollhouse livestream, we reach a strange diagram where the player, at times, sort of ceases to exist. And yet, simultaneously, without the player, the livestreamer, such scenarios would likely never happen. An even stranger and rarer occurrence is a phenomenon called developer trolling. While an audience is able to assert control in sort of abstract ways in most games, directing the flow of the stream and certain choices the streamer makes, there are developers that can very directly affect the game. They program tools into the video game itself that allow them to target and affect specific people's games as they happen in real time. This can be both fun and bad. My personal favorite example of developer trolling is in the game Cluster Truck. It's a very simple game. You parkour on top of trucks going through increasingly hard and crazy obstacle courses, from missiles to lasers to gigantic moving gears. If you want a crazy adrenaline-fueled experience, do cocaine. Okay, don't do that. Cluster Truck already had Twitch integration built into it, and so I suppose the developers figured they would allow themselves to have those same features and a little bit more. <laughs> you and your late what the what? What the f <laughs> what the hell was- Hello? Every single time it starts, you see the streamers get genuinely scared for a moment, it's hilarious. That being said, they aren't totally wrong for being scared of such a thing. In some corners of the internet, it's a pretty well-known story, but the thing about developer trolling is that some developers don't use it to make streams more fun for people. Spaceman Scott has already made a fantastic video about this, but in the game Welcome to the Game 2, a sort of FNAF-style Keep the Monsters Away game, the developers silently pushed an update through one day. One of the most avid players and streamers of the game, Castaway, started talking a little shit on the game's developer, Adam Flatow. And by a little shit, I mean that Castaway said that Adam seems like a little bit of an asshole from their impressions of him. As a result, Adam uh, approved that. Suddenly, Castaway's game started magically getting significantly harder, like near impossibly hard in an already incredibly difficult game. One so hard and sadistic that people have gotten personal beefs with the game developer in the past, just over its design. But Castaway didn't, and yet he still got the brunt end of some seedy ass tools snuck into the game overnight, all designed to sate this loser's fragile ego. Castaway was just unable to play the game on their original count ever again over it. Speedrunning guides need to specifically mention the possibility, this developer's childlike behavior being treated almost like a rare in-game event. Regardless, the consequence of the existence of developer trolling kind of shows an implied part of this chart that I never really considered before. In terms of interactivity, there is one more circle. The fact that games are created, and they're created by people. It's just that, in this instance, the creators kept that interactivity for themselves. Now, you might wonder what this video is leading to, but I honestly don't really have a conclusion. As I said, this is a more casual video like the ones I'll have on Nebula, but if there is something to take away, it is this. Video games, all video games, are art, and they're a very unique form of it. The mere existence of interactivity gives us so many new avenues for analysis and concepts and execution of art, and like all other art, it's deeply linked to the world around us, both culturally and functionally. We don't appreciate that video games did a sort of any percent art history speedrun in the course of like 30 years. It's cool and wild and we're living in it, and that's awesome. That's the whole conclusion. Main video content over. The end. If you like this sort of casual format, I intend to make many more videos like it on my Nebula page. As I said at the start, there's an extra video up there right now as we speak. If you use my link in the description or on screen, or in like a back alley somewhere, you'll get access to over 200 cool channels ad-free with exclusive and early content for almost everyone. It's $250 a month and with more actual good content than most streaming services.
Anyways, enough proselytizing, it's time for the Patreon. Shout out to my patrons, David Narcala, Jared Chode, Joltz, Wallace de Morinville, Zimborg, Arkin Atlin, Brody Larson, Denkley Voidly, Edmund Dong, SC, Godded, Great Value Gaming, Grinkle Stinkle, Lavender, MF Bitch Boy, Tommy, Tommy the fucking cat, what? Willem, a magic muffin, bestest patron, Big Dave, Brian Jackson, Chris Gunther Zach, Gluggle Jug, I always fuck that one up. Kyra, Maiden Batter, aka Mr. Trolley Mully. No Joke, Oat Flakes from Outer Space, Piezo, Ribbon Aster, Ro Ramden, Hello Ro, Robin Michael Becker, Ryan NG, Sess, Shaneful, Ted H, Terrifying Spoon, and Undersea Rex CVT. Thank you everyone, and thank you to everyone I didn't shout out to. And with that being done, I can stop showing my face on my main channel. I mean, thank. Fucking God.